Um, I'm Kevin Webb. I work with a uh, company called Conveil. Uh, we're actually based here in DC, I'm actually, but I'm one of the few people that actually work here. We have a team that's distributed uh, in quite a few places around the world. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, in Portland and uh, Paris, Atlanta, uh, and New York City. But uh, we have a group that, that kind of convenes around our office here in DC and uh, works on projects in a variety of places in the world. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about our work we're doing on transport modeling and using open data, and particularly OpenStreetMap, to, to reshape the way we think about uh, analysis of, of urban transportation systems and the way that those transportation systems interact with, with cities and the way we live in cities. Uh, but before I start on talking about the modeling, I just want to give you a little bit of history on this. Uh, I started out work on this at Open Plans along with a number of colleagues, some of whom I work, still work with now and some of whom are in the room here. Uh, they had the honor of working with at Open Plans a few years ago. Uh, and we actually got our start at Open Plans doing this work with Portland TriMet. Uh, and you heard some folks from Portland talk about the fine work that's going on out there. Um, I don't think we can give enough credit to Portland and the transportation community uh, in Portland, uh, particularly the folks at TriMet, for, for where we are in the world right now in terms of open data and transport. These folks have been thinking about this longer than just about anybody, and uh, they have some really, really great ideas that have shaped a lot of things that we, we all come and uh, know and use today, like Google Maps. They had a very big influence on that. Um, they came to Open Plans a few years ago and said, we want to do this better. Uh, we want to do multimodal routing in a way that people aren't currently doing. And this is, when we say multimodal, we're talking about really uh, you know, bringing together every mode of transport in the city and giving you a comprehensive view of it as a system. As a transit agency, they felt that was really fundamental to what they did because in Portland, it's a truly multimodal city and they've invested a lot of time and effort building that. And they want to show that to people when they talk about how to get around. So they asked us to help them build uh, an open source uh, software platform called Open Trip Planner, which is a, uh, a multimodal journey planner that takes uh, data in standard formats, uh, including OpenStreetMap, and then lets you actually do routing across public transport and then bike and ped and car. Uh, and actually the bike and ped and car space is getting more and more complicated. Folks that know in DC, we now, you know, bike is no longer just a bike, it's bike share, and there's a whole variety of dynamic dispatch car services. Those are kinds of things that are also in the multimodal space and the kind of things that we try to model with uh, Open Trip Planner. Um, so this app, just to, you know, one more, uh, kind of just talk about what it is. Um, it's an engine for doing routing. It's used in lots of different contexts. You know, Portland TriMet's website has it, but you also can download apps in the App Store. One of my favorites, the Transit app. Two guys in, in Montreal built this in a summer in their apartment. It's now used by about 1.5 million people, and it's one of the best transit apps uh, out there. I use it almost every day. If you're trying to look, look for ways to get around DC while you're here, I would highly recommend it. But these are the kinds of things that I, I point to as kind of open data, open source success stories, where you know, open data is out there for cities all around the world. Open source software is out there like Open Trip Planner, but lots of other layers of the stack that they were able to leverage. And they were able to build a really fantastic piece of software that helps people every day because of that. And it works in cities in North America, Europe, Latin America. Uh, and it's just the kind of stuff that we're trying to enable with this ecosystem. And to see this happen, it's really cool. So this is the kind of stuff we do on the public side. And it's enabled by uh, a couple of things. And I want to talk about how this works as a system. Uh, the first layer of this, and this is what got us started in the transport space, is GTFS. This is a, a data layer that lets us uh, understand how a transport system functions or a public transport system functions in a scheduled uh, service capacity. Uh, this is a diagram that was written, that was drawn by one of my colleagues at Open Plans. He really interned there, James Wong, who might be around this weekend. Uh, he put together a little diagram that shows what GTFS is and how it kind of connects different kind of conceptual elements of the transit system together into a data format that describes you know, where the stops are, where the routes are, how those stops are connected over time with timetables and schedules and fares. It's actually not very complicated in concept and the idea is that there's a really elegant data standard that's out there that helps people encode these in a universal format. There's over 1,500 cities in the world that now produce data in GTFS and let us model the transport system using that data. So this is an input to what we do. We combine that data with OpenStreetMap and we build a model of how the city actually functions at a, uh, as about a fine grain as we can get, which is down to the street segment level. And this is actually the street segment level at a different modal kind of layers. And this is a diagram of what we actually build to enable the kind of journey planning applications that I was just showing you. This is a model of, uh, I think it's in Midtown Manhattan, uh, and showing how the street network connects to the transit network on the Lexington Avenue line on uh, New York City. And it's showing you the kinds of things that we understand about this because of OSM. On the top, which are these black lines, which are showing the different modal restrictions of the network and how those streets are connected together and how you can traverse them as a pedestrian or as a car. 
or the cyclist. And then as you go down, you're actually going down into the street and you're leaving the kind of geographic space that we know in OpenStreetMap and you're entering this kind of temporal space that is the transit network that is, you know, kind of warps you between different parts of the city and is based entirely on timetables and uh, the kind of connectivity between those stops. And this is the model we get to build that helps you, you know, route you between places. And it's pretty familiar. We, you know, we use these kind of tools in you know, a lot of different contexts every day to get around. But what's really neat about this is that the data that lets us build this model to help you get around the city is actually one of the best models we've ever built of how a city works from a transportation perspective. And it's actually enabling us to ask a lot of other questions that are, used to be really hard and really expensive to ask. And that's what I want to talk about next, is kind of where we're going with this from an urban transport modeling uh, standpoint. And I'll start with an application, actually. I'm going to switch to a demo. And this is always a bad idea, but I think the network connection will actually work. Uh, we'll see in a second if there's actually internet. Let's see. Does it work? Yes, it does. Okay, that's lovely. All right. So this is, a, um, this is an application we're building right now with the Regional Plan Association of New York. This is not public yet, so do not tweet this link. Uh, but actually, and I have permission to share it with you. I'll see you're lucky. Uh, we could talk about this, but it'll be out next week. Uh, the Regional Plan Association is a, is a group up in New York City that uh, builds a regional plan of the city and helps people understand kind of urban systems and a lot of different levels, economic, social, environmental, transportation systems, how they all intersect. And they try to tell a story about how the city works as a system. About every generation they release a regional plan for the city that helps people understand where it's going, where it's come from, and what needs to be done to make it better. And they asked us to help them build a map that talks about how transport and jobs connect together. So they actually have uh, a lot of questions about those things. And the intersection between them is very complicated and very important. Uh, in terms of understanding who has access to jobs and what jobs are available to people. And transportation is really fundamental in kind of shaping that workforce integration. So we actually took a data set from the Census Bureau called LODES, which is a really fantastic data set to work with if you're interested in jobs. Um, and we connected it with Open Trip Planner to analyst to model where people live and how those people based on where they live are connected to different jobs within the city. This map is a, uh, there's a push pin here. We'll drop this and hopefully the internet will continue to work. It'll be, it looks like it's a little slow. There we go. And it draws a map that shows based on, you, if you're driving in this particular case and you have about 20 minutes, where can I get to and what jobs are accessible to me within that 20 minute period? It goes through and calculates the kind of coverage of that mode of transportation within that time limit, finds all the census blocks that are in that area, then aggregates the census data about those jobs and gives you a breakdown of the job type by percentage. And you know, basically, this also there's a time distribution here that you can't see, but you can just you know, kind of say, well, it's 15 minutes, and it brings in the, the boundary on this to show you what jobs are available to you in that period. Or you can switch to another mode and say, oh, let's look at transport or transit. And it goes and runs the same calculation. That one might just be because of walking distance there. There you go. So move it closer to a transit hub. And you start to see like, how you're connected to the rest of the city. Uh, through these different modes. And this is giving you over here on the top, uh, giving you a tally of what this means from an economic kind of, uh, you know, kind of workforce accessibility standpoint. This is just sliced by job type. The colors on the map are actually every dot is a job uh, in the census block as you're seeing each job in the city color coded by its type. And then you know, obviously within the time zone you're in. This is one way to look at the data. The other one actually I thought was kind of a neater example is actually looking at workforce. And this kind of gets you a sense of like the kinds of questions you can actually practically act with, ask with this. So I, I'm looking at a map right now where I turned off all the layers of this map. Uh, I think I'm going to curse her back. Turned off all the layers of this map except uh, tech jobs, just because that's you know, a lot of us are tech people. So just thought I would start with that. Um, and I put the pin over in, uh, in the lower let's say, uh, East Village around Tom's. Uh, yeah, this is in Alphabet City. And I asked, you know, how many people can I get, if I put my office here, how many tech workers are in the kind of this data set within 30 minutes by public transit? And I get a number of the total workforce, and I get a percentage of the information technology workforce and the number of people that are there. Actually, just turned off information technology, turned it back on. And you get a sense of what's there. Well, what if I wanted to put my office in Soho? This is where I used to work when I was at the folks at Open Plans. How many people can get there? In uh, a couple seconds later, we should have an answer that says there are about twice as many people can get there in 30 minutes by public transit. This is a cool part of the city, not very transit accessible. It's a, uh, kind of a dearth of transit off, uh, access there. Not necessarily a great place for that office to be. Drop it over into Long Island City, which gets lots of flack for being far away and not in Manhattan. Uh, it's actually uh, way, way more transit accessible than Soho. 
uh, which is right in the heart of the city. There's actually about you know, three times the number of people, or a little bit more than that, can get there in 30 minutes that are in the kind of workforce class that I'm looking at. These are the kind of questions that individuals, uh, you know, businesses and, and individual you know, people thinking about their relationship to the city might ask. But it's also, you know, it's the kind of gets at the beginning of what the folks at the RPA are doing, which they want to really understand the city as a whole and how it works. Um, this is a map where instead of going and looking at individual points, uh, we actually uh, asked it for every single point in the city and looked at uh, transit accessibility as a percentage of the total workforce to get to a place. Um, we just did that same thing I just showed you there, but we did it for everywhere in the city, actually everywhere in the tri-state metro region. Uh, and made this really interesting map that kind of shows you the percentage of the workforce that's available uh, at any of those places. And these are the kinds of things that the RPA wants to be able to point to to say, as we change transit infrastructure and as we change the way the spatial you know, dynamics of the city work, how does workforce accessibility change as a, as a question of that? Uh, and that's the kind of thing that used to be kind of hard to get an answer for. There's a lot of hand waving involved or a lot of money involved in getting an answer that was fairly imprecise. I made this in about five minutes. Um, I downloaded public data uh, from the New York MTA and from a, so a couple other uh, you know, a couple other data sources for GTFS for the region, and I got OSM. And within five minutes, I had a server running on my laptop that I could ask this kind of question. Uh, and it doesn't require uh, the level of effort that it used to take because the data is already being produced for other reasons. And it lets people start to ask these sorts of questions uh, in new ways uh, because of who can be involved in the conversation and because of the level of detail we can get into in the questions we ask because of the data is actually there to support it. Um, so this is where we are with kind of just asking some big kind of you know, macroeconomic questions or in case of the office location, a micro kind of question. Um, that, you know, that we really about where, you know, where should I individually make a choice. Uh, but this actually, you know, this is only half the story. This is talking about, you know, people and how they're spatially distribu distributed. The other question you can start to ask is, well, what has the transit network changes? Like, who benefits and how? And what, how should we make the transit network work the best as it possibly can? So I put together a little demo uh, for New York City that takes advantage of, this is a, a you know, kind of a, a cheap shot at a recent uh, news story where I went and decided to turn off the George Washington Bridge for the poor folks in Fort Lee. <laughs> and this was a really easy thing to do, actually. I downloaded OpenStreetMap. I removed the, <laughs> port, of th the port Authority toll booth at the George Washington Bridge. And all of a sudden, I had a map that showed me how much that sucked for those people. Um, so this actually is not, you know, this is a, should say this is not a, um, a map of measuring uh, capacity or demand for transit. We're not actually trying to model you know, how much the congestion occurred, which is actually what really made things miserable there. We're actually measuring the change in accessibility in terms of travel time. So this is map is showing a color gradient, basically, of where places were you know, uh, really negatively affected by uh, public transport, or you know, by a roadway network uh, access. So this is actually the darker the blue, the more minutes people lost in their potential to reach that place. And you notice as you get down to you know, the southern parts of Manhattan, there's tunnels there that get you just about as quickly as you would if you'd come in over the George Washington Bridge. Um, so you start to see like there's actually some, you know, it depends on where you're going. You know, same, it's like this, we did this for the whole region because that's just the way this data works. Uh, and so you see you get up to the Tappan Zee Bridge and all of a sudden things get back to where you'd expect them to be. This, again, five minutes. You know, o OSM, I deleted, I'll go back to my slides now and you'll see. All I had to do was open up to do. Open up OSM editor, delete the way or delete the node, save, load the data. Five minutes later, I had a map that modeled you know, urban transport accessibility before and after the George Washington Bridge got closed. Um, so this is, you know, this is where we are right now, which is really an incredible place to be in the world where we can start to make these kind of you know, large scale analyses possible and you can start to model you know, these changes in these large scale systems without any complicated tooling or that anything other than what's already available for you to work and play with this public data set. Uh, but there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more detail we can get into than just looking at, you know, the kind of political consequences of, you know, of things like toll booths getting closed. This is a, an example that a colleague of mine, uh, Andrew Bird, made in Paris after the folks in Paris decided to release their uh, GTFS data set. Uh, he actually downloaded the day that they released the data set and then created a GTFS feed with some of his colleagues there in Paris that represented a future uh, transport line. This is one that's being built right now and it'll be built over the next couple decades. Uh, and within a couple hours of having this GTFS you know, available for the whole city and the data they made to modify the feed to include this new future uh, circumferential route, 
they had a map up and going that they could start to show people their individual impact that this would have in their lives in terms of their commute times across the city. And this is again you know, a, a single point origin travel time difference map that actually shows if you live over there in that little spot on the, in the, uh, in the, in the south and east of the city, if you're getting somewhere else in the circumference of the city that your travel time is going to change by about 45 minutes as a result of this line. Um, and again, the people that, that built the line, they kind of already knew this. They did a lot of modeling and spent a lot of money to figure this out. But he was able to do this in a couple of hours and create, a, you know, create something that allowed people to interact and ask questions about this in a way that has generally not been accessible to people. And there's a lot of different ways you can think about how this gets used. But one of them is, in this case, it was done for this purpose, is about engaging people in the conversation and getting them to think about you know, how they can personalize the, the understanding of how big infrastructure decisions shape their individual experience of the city. And the other side is getting people to ask the questions more frequently and uh, more robustly as part of political discourse, which is unfortunately not something that is always what drive, these sorts of analyses are not always what drive uh, policy decisions in transport. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. This is another example I want to show. Uh, this is moving away from the maps I just showed here and here, which are about time, and coming back to uh, you know, a measure of something other than time, which I think is really important in this work, which is that you know, when we look at transport, you know, time is one of the things that it, 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 it is a consequence of it that we care about. But it's actually not really what our experience of the city is. It's really about what we can do. And that's when we talk about accessibility analysis, which all of this falls under that. It's not about you know, how quickly you can get there. It's about what you can do as a consequence of being able to get there that quickly. And this is a map of New York City showing uh, the population that can reach any given point in the city within an hour using public transit. Uh, and the, the bright colored areas here are uh, about 7 million people, if I remember correctly. Uh, can reach uh, those areas and it drops off to you know, the hundreds of thousands really quickly as you get away from the urban core. Uh, this is a map that was created, you know, again, just using publicly available data. And this is a map that was using that same publicly available data with all the transit service that was uh, disrupted by Hurricane Sandy turned off. And this was actually created by a software developer who was at home who couldn't get to work uh, and was curious about what actually was going on and how he could understand that. So he edited the GTFS feed himself and shared it with people. And we were able to run this analysis you know, really quite easily uh, thanks to his work you know, figuring out what lines had been disrupted and in what ways. And he was able to model the actual impact and who was impacted and by how much you know, of this sort of thing. So you can start to see that you can ask really complex questions uh, using these data sets and not a lot of extra effort to, you know, to modify them and, and turn them into a conversation about something that has really never been accessible to you know, a large number of people before. So it's really neat to see people taking advantage of this and, and actually uh, exploring these kind of questions. And as that happens, uh, the hope is that we actually can start to have, this is actually the same map with the percent change not rather than just absolute numbers of population. But as it happens, we can, the hope is actually we can start to have you know, policy conversations about public transport that are based on people's actual experience and understanding of what's going on rather than just about the politics of this. And uh, I'll give an example of you know, what, what the consequence is. This kind of come back to the phantom toll booth uh, thing here with Fort Lee. Uh, that, you know, one of the really unfortunate things about the toll booth story is that um, it actually really doesn't matter that much. Uh, it, you know, it was, it was a you know, kind of interesting you know, bad day for people in Fort Lee. But in comparison to the, the decision, this is kind of getting my soapbox, a decision that Governor Christie made a while before that to not build a giant tunnel uh, that connected uh, New Jersey to New York City, which is going to permanently affect the commutes of millions of people. Uh, that th this, is, this is something where you know, the kinds of conversations we need to be having about who's affected and by how much and in what ways in public transport contexts, uh, these sorts of tools can actually really help shape that. And there actually should have been a lot more writing and outrage over what he did with the tunnel than there should have been about what happened in Fort Lee because it actually affected a really large number of people. And those people don't have a real voice in this conversation because a lot of times these are very technical conversations. They're very hard to understand. And it's very hard to have a discourse around that when, when it's like, you know, there's objective things we can say and there's political things we can say and those aren't connected. And the hope is that by, you know, having these sorts of tools and data sets available and in the hands of more people, that that actually can start to change and we can actually get more people involved in these and actually start to see, you know, directly who's affected and, and in what ways. And just a really quick example of where that's being done uh, in, a, in a neat way is in Seattle right now where there's a really unfortunate uh, service cut that's being considered. Uh, as part of the bus service there. And one of the, one of the questions that folks are, are actually using these tools and we're, we're trying to help them with that right now is uh, looking at ways to understand who's affected by the service cuts and really have a public conversation about whether that's uh, a fair way to build a city. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, that 
if without these sorts of analysis as part of that conversation, really quickly become ugly conversations and don't need to be when you can actually put them on the table and have a dialogue about you know, very, the kind of very uh, objective layers of that to then build up to much more you know, complex public policy conversations. So um, I just want to just say really quickly uh, that this is a, a large project. I'm, I'm very lucky to work with folks at Conveil who contribute to the projects uh, and play a big role in Open Trip Planner, but this is a really fantastic example of open source uh, working the way it's supposed to work. There are a lot of people who contribute to the software and use the software and have advanced the thinking around how this sort of work is done. And this is a list of the folks that we're kind of currently uh, in conversation with, but it's actually a much bigger list than this. Um, and you know, there, I would encourage folks who are interested in this sort of thing to join the dialogue around this and, and help shape where it goes. Uh, it's a very collaborative group. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk just a little bit about OSM uh, and the kind of things that we've learned about OSM and want to see uh, made better and we want to contribute to. The first thing is actually something that came up earlier with uh, the pedestrian routing. I was really glad to see this, this conversation about what you guys were doing, the kind of micro-modeling of pedestrian access. This is a, a zoomed-in view of that map I showed you of the job access in New York City uh, by percent. And if you look over in the lower... Um, let's see the lower left hand side there. You can see a very hard line where it, this is actually about in Floral Park out in uh, Long Island, where you can see that there's a very sharp line with transit accessibility. And that's actually caused by exactly the thing you were talking about with pedestrian access. There's a lot of really great micro modeling of transit uh, and particularly pedestrian infrastructure in OSM. But because of the, uh, the it's often drawn from a kind of an aesthetic perspective, like you know where it is and making it look right. It's not drawn from a routing perspective. This really great transit infrastructure connected to this train center, you know, to the street network, didn't actually connect. The lines were all drawn, but they didn't actually connect to the streets. And that just kind of breaks a lot of things. The good news is that we don't see this very often. And the other good news is it's very easy to fix. The, the bad news is it's not uh, always easy to find. And one of the things that we can do with routing tools is, is find better ways to discover these. And the best way to fix them is to make sure they never get created in the first place. And we need to talk about how editing tools can be smarter about network connectivity so that nobody ever creates a street that doesn't connect to another street or a pedestrian access point that never connects to the rest of the world. Uh, it's actually quite easy to do that from a user interface and to solve it right up front. But if we don't, we don't solve it up front, then we, we create you know, lots of these little things that have to be addressed after the fact, which are, are quite frustrating. Um, and then finally, this is a, a bigger uh, topic conversation, but it's an important one, is uh, traffic and uh, roadway speeds. I showed a lot of maps that actually do modeling of, of, uh, trans, of, kind of transport network from the car side. And we really need traffic data to do this well. We, we need it for the aggregate. We, we are lucky that we can get away with kind of fudging a little bit on specific trips because we're adding up millions of trips and giving you a, a total. But if you're trying to do actual directions, you actually really, really need this data. And this is my slide about uh, traffic data in OSM. Uh, there is a really big problem we need to think of as a community about how we solve this and make this a more interesting conversation. Uh, I've got some ideas about it. I've had some really good opportunities to work with folks at the World Bank. Holly Crambeck, who's in the audience here, has thought a lot about this. Uh, and there's ways that this can be fixed. Fix the folks at Telenav obviously are doing some really great work around this. Uh, we've got to get the data back into OSM. Um, that's something we've got to solve. But I will just say this is how we, uh, we solve the issues of using roadway classifications as an indicator for potential speed, looking at some research data about what roads were actually, you know, what carry different speeds. It could be made a lot more precise by looking at density and things like that in the city, urban core. This is a graph of our New York City map with about 1,500 uh, random journeys uh, compared against a proprietary and will not be named uh, journey planner that you may have used recently. Uh, and the, comparing the, the drive times on each of those together, it's actually a pretty tight correlation even with our kind of like dumb, uh, you know, kind of just averages that we're using. It gets us a good number on the, on the individual, but on a, on a, on a case by, or on a, in the aggregate, but on a case by case basis, you probably don't want to be telling people these things. So if you're looking at doing car routing, uh, in OSM, you really care about this conversation and you should be having a dialogue about how to make it better. So that's it for me. Uh, happy to take questions and go from there. So thanks.